Hi everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jim Duffy, and I'm responsible for the marketing sales of all the services we have here at Code. Yes, Code is much more than just a magazine. The world of Code includes Code Magazine, of course, but also Code Consulting, Code Training, and Code Staffing. I see some familiar names on the attendee registration list. Whether this is your first time attending one of our webinars or the fifth, thanks for joining us. In addition to Marcus answering questions in the webinar, we have expert members of our code consulting team in the chat room, so jump in and ask your questions in the chat window. If you don't currently subscribe to Code Magazine, you will soon. As a benefit for attending, based on the email you registered with, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free digital Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe. I've also included a free subscription link to share with your coder friends, associates, colleagues, team lead, CTO, social media followers, enemies, your arch nemesis, etc. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Those of you who have attended our previous webinars or have seen him speak at conferences or have attended any of our training classes over the years, you're very familiar with Marcus. For everyone else, Marcus is the big kahuna around here. He's the code president and chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, and all around nice guy. He'll be ready to start in just a moment. Sharing the presenter duties today is Dr. Otto Dobritzberger. Otto is one of our senior software developers. He earned his master's and PhD in computer science from the University of Houston. His background is in heavy computational genetic and genomic data analysis using C and C++. He specializes in WPF, C Sharp, and C++, and is proficient in several other languages as well. He has authored scientific papers, magazine articles, he's a frequent speaker at conferences, and an adjunct professor at the University of Houston. When not writing code, he's usually found somewhere in the gym, training for his next powerlifting competition. Yes, that picture is 700 pounds. We here at Code provide ourselves on helping people build better software. We build custom solutions from the ground up for some clients, modernize legacy applications for others, as well as supporting, maintaining, and or enhancing existing applications for others. Whether it's a cloud-based application, an on-prem solution, a web application, a mobile app, or a Windows desktop application, we can help with whatever platform you're targeting. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help you with your project. Got questions? Maybe you're unsure about what technology or platform to use for your next project. Perhaps you're looking for guidance about what client-side JavaScript framework to use. Maybe you have questions about developing for the cloud. Perhaps you have questions about database architecture. We'd be happy to spend an hour or so on the phone with members of your organization answering your team's questions and team's questions and providing guidance. No charge, no strings, no commitment, no credit card, just free help from our code experts. Reach out to me about getting your free hour of code scheduled. Slots are limited, and my email is on the slide. Of course, we would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you like what you see here today or have seen in our prior webinars. Talent is something we're always on the lookout for. Whether it's adding talent to our software development teams or finding authors to write for the magazine, check out these links if you're interested. Our code staffing division can help provide developers to augment your development team if necessary. Finally, we would like to have your feedback about this webinar in the form of a short survey. The survey is very short and you'll finish in no time flat. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I wanna share that the slides and recording of today's webinar and all of our webinars will be available on the state of that net page on the code website. I've included that link here. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Thanks for listening. Marcus is ready to go. So the stage is yours, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, great to see a huge turnout for today's event. Uh, so good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Early morning for me, where I'm currently at. So uh, lots of stuff to talk about today. Um, I got my good friend Otto Dobritzberger here. Like Jim said in the intro, he's going to help us out with some, some demos. We're going to have lots of that today. But what is this all about? Well, we want to talk about what's new in Blazor 5. Uh, we've talked about Blazor before. That was a hugely popular talk. This is kind of the follow-up because Blazor has now been well-established and is a fundamental part of .NET 5. So how is all of that going? We want to take a look at Blazor adoption as always. 
I want to share our experiences with you that we have both as a magazine and also as a consulting and training company. Basically share what we hear in the marketplace, share what we hear from our authors, our influencer networks, and the Blazor adoption, which is a little bit difficult to figure out, is a big part of that. Now we got to start at the beginning. I know there's a lot of new people here today, so we'll spend a little bit of time just looking at Blazor in general. Uh, if you've already seen that part, just bear with me. It's not going to be that long, but we want to make sure that we have everybody on board with what we're doing. But a big part is going to be what's new in Blazor. In Blazor, we'll take a look at a lot of uh, samples. The whole WebAssembly versus server side is always an interesting topic. Uh, we'll take a look at progressive web apps, PWAs a little bit. And then towards the end, we'll spend a little bit of time kind of as a surprise entry on this new thing called Fotino. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, that's a fairly interesting topic, I think. But let's start with the Blazor overview. By the way, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer questions as we'll go. Uh, I know there usually is a lot of questions. So I'll, I'll answer some as we go and then probably the bulk uh, towards the end of the presentation. We'll do a Q&A session. And then when I look over here on this side, that's my control center. It's not that I'm losing interest uh, over here. I get my questions fed to me by my minions behind the scenes. I have several people in the chat that will try to answer your questions directly and pass those on to me that I need to be answering. So feel free to ask questions and we'll do our best to get that. Now, also, as I always say, consider us a resource that you can draw upon if you have further questions after the presentation. Send us an email, send them to myself if you want, but also to Jim because I'm perpetually behind on my emails. It sometimes takes me a long time and it's easier to get uh, other people to answer it, but we will answer all your emails, I promise. And we're not the kind of company that'll send you a bill for just a five minute email answer. So with that, uh, let's get this going and let's talk about what Blazor is in general for those of you who haven't looked into Blazor yet. Uh, fundamentally, Blazor is a new web development framework. Now, why on earth would we need another web development framework? We already have a lot of JavaScript frameworks out there. Uh, we have things like Vue, we have things like Angular, um, and so on. That slowed down a little bit. We used to always say JavaScript frameworks are the flavor of the week. Luckily, that craziness has played out a little bit. And so uh, we do see three major frameworks out there right now, Vue, Angular, and React. Those are well established. Great, use them if you want them, we do a lot. But in addition, we now also have Blazor. And why is Blazor so special? Because it is based on .NET. It fundamentally gives you a different alternative. It gives you a different skill sets you can use. When you really think about what we've done on the web is we've reduced this plethora of choices we had in the past, plethora of choices in, in programming languages, We've reduced that down to JavaScript. Now, if you're not a JavaScript guy, JavaScript is probably not as bad as you heard. Um, it's actually a pretty good language. And then there's some flavors of that, like TypeScript. So those are actually pretty good languages, but some people like it, some people do not. Some scenarios it's great for, some it's not. Uh, in general, when we look at programming languages, they all have their pros and cons for different scenarios. And in the web, we pretend that's not the case. Uh, and with Blazor, that's kind of come to an end. With Blazor, you now have the option to use .NET languages, uh, in particular C Sharp, and get all the benefits of that, uh, strong typing and so on. And you can mix and match that with JavaScript as well. So that is the interesting part, and that's why it's so fundamentally different from all other JavaScript-based uh, frameworks. Now, the UI technology for Blazor still is HTML. Nothing has changed on the UI. You're not gonna build WPF or WinUI or anything like that. It's still HTML. It's entirely cross-platform. Uh, it's just another option to do development on the, on the web. So in short, we need it because it gives us the option to have a .NET-based, strongly typed, um, new client UI development framework uh, in the browser. And yes, this absolutely, to add a spoiler here right away, this absolutely means you can now run C Sharp in the browser as one of the options, uh, probably the most exciting option that's available. Um, 
And, and, and that's pretty cool for a number of reasons. Now here is a, a bit of an overview, a quick rundown of what these reasons are. Uh, first of all, the C-sharp language, how does that even work? Well, the C-sharp language compiles to a target that's called WebAssembly. We'll talk about WebAssembly in a moment. WebAssembly is this new darn near to binary standard that all the major browsers support. So this runs cross-platform, it runs in Windows, it runs on the Mac, it runs in Linux, it runs on iOS, it runs on Android, anything that runs these new browsers, this just runs natively because Microsoft compiles to this new target. Uh, that means you don't just have the C-sharp language, but you have all the great tooling and the very sophisticated IDEs uh, not just the Microsoft ones, but all the C-sharp and .NET IDEs work with this. So that's awesome. It's very stable. Uh, C-sharp has been continuously developed in a compatible fashion for over two decades now, uh, same as uh, the other .NET platforms and languages. So you have great stability. You have a great ecosystem that you can draw from. So there's lots of third-party providers that provide lots of stuff around uh, this whole setup. Uh, it's still entirely based on standards. So this is not Microsoft going out, doing something on their own. A lot of people always say, well, how is this different from what Silverlight was? I got burned with Silverlight because Microsoft ended that and then I had my whole Silverlight investment. Well, this is based on standards. So you're still writing HTML, you're still using CSS. You're just targeting this thing called WebAssembly. You get great code reuse and code share. So a lot of the code you'll already have, you can probably just reuse or reuse in very similar fashion. Uh, so that's huge. Uh, this investment that you've made over the last two decades on the .NET platform, you will probably get a lot of benefit out of that, even in this particular use case scenario. Uh, it's component-based. Now, at this point, we're getting into a very interesting part of the framework. The way you're building uh, Blazor applications, the way the framework works is component-oriented. So it's very easy to write UI components and then compose your HTML-based UI out of it. So you can create essentially an HTML page, but you can create your own tags that represent part of the UI. And, and again, we'll see that as the presentation goes on. And then also, and this is very important and should not be overlooked, you get skill reuse out of this. Uh, that means rather than learning a completely new environment, a completely new language, you can reuse your C-sharp skills. That's of course important for yourself. If you are a manager of a team, that's probably even more important. If you have 20, 30 people sitting in a department that need to start building a new application, while it certainly is a lot easier to let them move to Blazor where they can reuse most of their skills rather than go into a completely new environment. Now, some questions online. What are the languages? Right now, we're mostly talking about C Sharp. Uh, however, you can also bring in assemblies that are based on other things because essentially you can use just about any .NET assembly in this new setup. So if you have an F-sharp assembly that does some advanced computational things or, or data science type of stuff or whatever you want to use it for, you can probably just bring in this assembly. Now there's some limitations around security and, and just what makes sense in a browser, uh, but generally speaking, that should work. So that's a question online. Uh, see, the question's are already coming in. Uh, a lot of them will be addressed in my talk anyway, so I'm just going to move along for now. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about Blazor is that there's really two different Blazors. Um, there's Blazor WebAssembly, and that's the thing that runs in the client. Uh, now, that to me is by far the most exciting part about Blazor. Uh, so what you can do with that is essentially what I just told you. You can write C-sharp code. C-sharp code compiles to WebAssembly. It therefore can run in the browser, kind of similar to how JavaScript runs in the browser. The execution of that is actually very, very similar. And then you use this new framework Microsoft has given us on top of the HTML stuff that makes it easy to build these applications. So there's really two different things even within WebAssembly going on. One is the ability to run C-sharp code. The other is this framework that Microsoft is giving us. Now, as it turns out, this framework is actually pretty darn nice. Um, so a lot of people want to use that, but don't want to run in the browser. 
And then you can use Blaze as server side. Blaze as server is essentially the identical programming model, except it runs on the server more like, say, uh, an ASP.NET application, an ASP.NET MVC app, or even like an older web forms app. Conceptually, those are similar. Now, Blazor is much better because it's based on newer technology, but conceptually, they are very, very similar. So that just gives you that framework without running in the client. And we'll take a look at the pros and cons of that in great detail in this talk today. But it, it's interesting that you can switch between those two. Now, truth be told, it's not just a switch of a button or a switch of a configuration setting. The code base is a very similar, but some of the things you do can be different. For instance, if you're doing Blazor WebAssembly and you want to load your customer data, you're probably going to call some kind of web service. Now in Blazor server, you could call a web service, but in most cases, what people do is they just open a connection to a database somewhere. So you could use Entity Framework, for instance, you just open a, a connection to the database and that doesn't just work out of WebAssembly because you, security wise, you're probably gonna be prohibited from that. So, those are the two different options you have. Now, personally, like I said, to me, the real exciting stuff is WebAssembly. And to me, Blazor Server in a way was kind of this, oh, this thing that Microsoft could do early and, and why not make this available and then we'll all move to WebAssembly. As it turns out in the real world, it's actually quite split. A lot of people just enjoy this framework so much that they actually use Blazor on the server and, and that's more popular than I would have expected. Now, just really quick, uh, a few of the features. And by the way, the prior state of .NET we did in the fall about Blazor in the .NET Core 3.x timeframe, I go through this in a lot more detail. Uh, this is just kind of a recap and then we'll move on to the newer stuff. But here's just an overview of the things that you get on top of just running C-sharp code. There's a nice component model, the, the layout features that it has, routing, uh, all that kind of stuff that you would expect from a framework like this. And, and of course, as we move along into .NET 5 that we have now moved into or .NET 6 in the future, you can now expect this to, to be iterated upon and just Microsoft's adding new features as you would expect, performance improvements and so on. And so it's just becoming a much more mature uh, framework as we are seeing people taking to this more and more. Okay, there's a lot of questions online. Just a, a real quick thing. I think we talked about MVC Core versus R Razor and Blazor. Blazor is just a, an alternative uh, framework setup uh, for that. But when you run it server side, it's very, very similar. Um, third party components are also supported. You can call them, uh, including C, but that's a little trickier. Uh, Compatibility of existing third-party components used in existing applications. Third-party components uh, do work, but it depends on what they do. If the third-party component is something that, that accesses a database, well, that's only gonna work on the server because it makes no sense to do that in the browser. Uh, UI components, they're actually different, but lots of the third-party vendors have new UI components. So. Um, anyway, I'm gonna get to a lot of these questions as the, as the talk goes on. So anyway, uh, Blazor release versions, uh, it's been fast and furious. We now have .NET 5, that happened in November and Blazor is now included as a core component of .NET 5. Uh, so that's just in there if you install .NET 5, if you have a Visual Studio version that has the .NET 5 SDK installed, that's just in there. The original Blazor version was released with .NET Core 3X and actually kind of out of band. So the, the first SDK, in other words, the earliest version you need of .NET Core for this to run is 3.1.300. Uh, so that's where it originally came from. So let's talk about Blazor adoption. That's really, to me, one of the interesting parts of today's talk because Microsoft put out a new framework. How do people like it? And if this takes off, this could be huge. If people don't care, then, well, this is probably just going to die a quick death. Uh, now, that's not the case. It's not going to die a quick death. It's actually very popular. But it is a little bit difficult, to tell you the truth, to figure out exactly how many people are using this. Microsoft's not putting out any hard numbers. In fact, I don't think they have hard numbers. How many Blazor apps are there out in the real world? How many Blazor apps are running internally? 
uh, in, in enterprise setups, how many Blazor apps really drive, uh, say, a mobile app that sits in the app store somewhere? That's really difficult to say, even for Microsoft. So we need to look at other indicators. Um, one of the indicators we have as a company that provides a magazine and training and, and has a lot of community involvement is that Blazor drives a lot of interest. Now, this event today, for instance, is the most popular Stata.net event we've done uh, by a good 20% over our prior record, which I believe was the last Blazor talk. Uh, so there's a ton of interest in the community. There's a ton of just anecdotal evidence where people just talk to us a lot about Blazor. We get a lot of questions about Blazor. Uh, we've done a lot of other presentations, uh, whether it's our own or things like .NET Con. And it always drives a lot of interest. So clearly, Blazor is a very hot topic, especially within people that are already coming from a Microsoft angle. No surprise there because it's C sharp and people like that. Uh, but yeah, we know that it's that it's quite popular. We also know that .NET 5 has been the fastest adopted version of .NET ever. And I have a, a few more statistics on that here in a moment. So that's interesting. .NET 5 is going really, really well. And within .NET 5, we know from Microsoft that Blazor is the fastest growing workload. So .NET 5 is going well, and within that, Blazor is the leader. So in short, we know that it's actually quite popular based on this um, circumstantial evidence, I guess you would call it. Um, the .NET ecosystem, I have a few slides here that I kind of stole from Microsoft or that they gave me to show in today's presentation. Uh, so when you look at .NET 5 in general, just to give you an idea, there's a ton of stuff going on. We have uh, millions of developers just in Visual Studio alone. Uh, .NET Core has rated as the most loved framework on Stack Overflow um, uh, polls for the last two years in a row. We know that the .NET Core project is, in, is always in the top 30 highest velocity open source projects. Uh, so there's a ton of effort behind it, ton of people involved. It's not just the Microsoft effort, but it's open source, so a lot of other people are, are involved. We know that C Sharp continuously ranks in the top five most popular programming languages. Uh, we know that this stuff performs well and scales well. ASP.NET Core, uh, I guess it depends on who you ask. And Microsoft, of course, is giving me a slide here uh, with a, a stat that looks good. Uh, but it is drastically faster than Node.js at this point. Um, and so on. Lots of students are, are taking to .NET Core, which is great to see because that wasn't always the case. So lots of interesting stuff happening there. A little more about the ecosystem here. Uh, there's currently more than 5 million monthly active developers in the Visual Studio family or on top of .NET. So that means Microsoft has a lot more customers than 5 million that do Visual Studio development occasionally, but more than 5 million of them use it monthly as their development tool. Um, so yeah, so lots of interesting stuff here. Uh, the slide deck you'll be able to download later uh, from our Stata.net slide. We'll be making that available immediately after the talk today. These slides in the comments actually have more links towards more information about that that I don't have time to go into, but I wanted to put that in there for you anyway. Um, here's one more of those slides. But so the, the big point I'm making here is this stuff is moving fast and we are, we are getting a lot of new people onto this platform. So this isn't just going to go away. This isn't and a lot of people have this concern that, oh, what if this dies like, like Silverlight did, then my investment goes out the window again. Of course, I'm not Microsoft. I can't tell you what their strategy is, but it sure doesn't look like it. Every indicator that we have looks uh, really, really promising and, and some promise is already fulfilled. All right, um, really quick, let's talk about WebAssembly because this is an important thing to understand because WebAssembly is changing the web and, uh, and it's here to stay, it's been around for a while. What is this thing? Well, WebAssembly is a standard that all modern browsers uh, support that enables us to create binary code that runs in the web browser. So it's almost like, like bytecode 
almost like the original assembler or or the targets that say a .NET compiler or C++ compiler and Windows would compile to. It's just a tiny step removed from that um, from that layer, and it enables us to have a, a binary target that we can compile to that any compiler maker can compile to and run in the browser. And this gives us near native native performance on the web cross platform. Okay. So very, very nice. This is originally used by C++ game developers that needed extra performance out of the browser games they wrote, but it is now becoming available more and more to other languages. And that's what Microsoft is taking advantage of. That's an important point to understand. This is not a Microsoft standard. It's a standard that's out there. Microsoft is just using it for this. Uh, so what happens is you write your code that compiles to WebAssembly or a WASM file, as we say. That's a, a binary file, and that can then be combined with the web's UI layers, HTML, CSS, and even JavaScript. You can interrupt the JavaScript, but the, the goal, of course, is to use mostly CSS and HTML. Now, in Microsoft's world, how does this work? Well, in Microsoft world, Microsoft's world, that means we have a .NET runtime implementation that is a WASM-based runtime implementation. So just like you can install the CLR on Windows or the Mac or wherever, uh, there now is one that runs in WebAssembly in the browser. And that means that once we have that, all .NET components can then run within limitations because there's, you know, there's security and there's things that don't make sense. I mean, you can't uh, start a WinForms app within that and then expect it to work on iOS. Uh, so that would make sense. But within these sensible limits, it means that your uh, .NET project will work. What browsers does this work on? Uh, like I said, all the major new browsers, always worth pointing out uh, which ones those are. It works on the new Chromium Edge, which by the way, it's not the topic for today, but is very, very popular and going very well. It of course also works on Google's Chrome. These two are essentially on the engine level identical anyway. Uh, it works on the older Edge browser. It works in Firefox, Opera, Safari. So this gives you very, very wide range of execution capabilities. Anything that runs a web browser, pretty much you can run on. Now, there's one important omission here that you may have noticed, and that is Internet Explorer. It doesn't run in Internet Explorer. It never will. Internet Explorer is a dead end. If you still have to support it, A, I'm very sorry for you because that's a pain, but B, it's an old browser. You only get the old stuff. The newer version is now Edge Chromium, and that's what you should use to if you can. I completely understand that's not always possible. But unfortunately, if you're stuck in the old browser, you're stuck with the old tech. Uh, but on everything else, uh, this works fine and you can use it. Okay, more info about how specifically uh, Blazor works in this uh, WASM environment. So in Blazor, we have typically C sharp files, and then later we may have other languages, but for now it's C sharp directly combined with Razor pages. So if you're already familiar with Razor pages, you're gonna feel right at home uh, in Blazor. Those two get then compiled into a DLL. That DLL gets deployed into the browser. What's not shown here is you can also reference other DLLs. So if you have some other .NET DLL, especially .NET Core, .NET 5, that will probably just work and you may even work with older ones. And then you have some runtime DLLs that also get deployed into the browser. All that gets packaged. When the user surfs to that web page, that stuff gets served up. There is a little bit of a downside there in that the first time you do this, depending on how big your app is, there may be a slight wait time. Now in the future, or on subsequent hits that gets cache. Uh, and Microsoft has done a lot of work in the .NET 5 timeframe to make that pain go away. Um, but there's still a little bit of delay. It's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, that's probably to me the biggest downside of Blazor, but again, it's getting less and less and it's not that big a deal anymore. And then anyway, once you have that, it runs in the browser like I showed in the prior slide. So that's how that works. So taking a quick look at what we have here in the questions. Yeah, and uh, I think most of these questions I'm getting to, I'll, I'll just be responding to those as it goes, and then um, we'll do a 
a Q&A afterward. So let's just switch into Visual Studio and let's just take a very quick look at Blazor. So when you create a new Visual Studio project, I'm doing this here in regular Visual Studio, you have a Blazor app template in your project templates. You can search for it. For me, it shows up as my most recently used one because I've practiced stuff here. And I'm gonna put this into my test folder and we'll just hit create. And then a secondary dialog pops up. And in the secondary dialog, we can specify, do we want to create a server Blazor app or do we want to create a client Blazor app? And we can also specify which version uh, that we want to use. So let's use .NET 5. Uh, you do need Visual Studio 19.8, I think at least, and the .NET 5 SDK installed for this to run. We can set up a few additional things, like do we want to configure HTTPS? Uh, do we need an ASP.NET backend to get our data, for instance? Um, do we want to make a PWA? We'll talk about that later. But for now, we'll just go ahead and we'll create that. And this goes out and like any Visual Studio project, just goes ahead and creates this project for us. And this takes a moment, especially while I'm screen sharing. Okay, and here is our Blazor project. And you'll notice that this, it's different, but you'll also find your way around if you've done anything with, uh, with ASP.NET style web development. So we have a WW root folder, there's an index HTML in here. Uh, and in this index HTML, it's, it's a typical single page app. So we are setting up a few things in here, uh, header, uh, a div tag that'll make for the app, an, an error message if it doesn't work. Uh, but so this is very similar in concept to what you'd see, say, in an Angular app or, or something like that, that sets up a single page application. And then on top of that, we have things uh, such as our Razor pages. So again, there's an index page here, and this just pops up uh, a HTML-based UI. So you do standard HTML in here, but also note that it has this special tab. It says here, survey prompt. Well, survey prompt is a separate component that we developed in Blazor. So this is part of the Blazor UI, and, and we could now drill into this and try to find this. So here's that survey prompt. And so just because we've made the survey prompt.razor page, it now becomes a component that we can use. So that's not technically part of WebAssembly. This also works on the server. This is just the framework that Microsoft's giving us. And there was a question online, if uh, Blazor supports component-based development, this directly answers your question. Yes, it does in this simple fashion. So let's actually go ahead. Let's hit a five here and let's start this. And this will do some compilation may restore some NuGet components, uh, compiles to this uh, WASM target. So this will make an app like no one, uh, no other that you've ever used if you've never used Blazor. But at the end of the day, we don't really care. It's just a .NET app and it runs our .NET code. So I'm gonna take a little moment for the first time. Now the build succeeded. It's gonna fire up uh, my runtime environment here. It's going to launch it into the browser uh, over here on the screen. I'm getting a firewall warning the first time I do it. And let's move the browser over here. And after a moment, this should come up. Yeah. Once I click my way through all the warnings, And as you can see, it's still loading. It's, it's gonna go a little bit faster in your environment because it always goes slower when I do my screen sharing. And here we go, the app's now loading. And you can see this is uh, still loading for a while. Uh, this is what I said that downside was, that overhead was, but we'll talk about how to alleviate that because there's a bunch of new stuff in, in .NET 5. But in any event, here is our Blazor application now. And it looks like any other HTML app, this is HTML. Uh, and you see here's our heading one, but here's also a survey component. And so we can do this brief survey if we want. Uh, and this is just the component that shows up. Now, if we drill into the debug tools here, you'll notice that this is a little bit different from your typical web application. I know this is small, but we're not gonna take a, a really close look at this. 
Uh, but if I refresh that, you'll see that there is now a WASM element in here. And this is where .NET now loads these compiled pieces. If you build a server-side app, Blazor Server, you're not gonna see this, it's just gonna be HTML. Now that's when you build these components and you go one way or the other, that's the main difference you will see. The Blazor server-side app is gonna look amazingly similar, the templates are the same. So by just looking at the app, you may not notice a real difference. Now we can browse around in this app, there's this counter component as a sample, and we can just click this and it counts up our counter here. As you can see, this is C-sharp code running. In fact, if we were to look back into our source code here, let's look at the counter component. You see in here, we have more HTML. Uh, we have a paragraph. Now this paragraph uses the special razor page syntax to bind to, in this case, a field. Now the field is defined in a, co defined in a code segment here, and this is one way of running C-sharp code inside the browser. So just like you would add JavaScript code in your HTML, you can run the C-sharp code in here. And here's that counter, and we have a button object here, and this button uses this uh, razor or this blazer click event that calls an increment count method. The increment count is down here. All it does is it increments this variable and uh, which changes this, and therefore the thing that's bound up here shows up. And this all runs as C sharp code in the browser works anywhere. You can run this on iOS now uh, or Android and so on, and it would, would work exactly the same, okay? So that's the quick version of what Blazor is like. We could now go and we could do the same exact thing as a server-side application, and you would be surprised how little difference you can see when you actually do this, okay? Um, what it does behind the scenes, however, is it, it the server side would run all that C-sharp code on the server and then just communicate back and forth, uh, updating the UI. So it's almost like an update panel app, the old update panel on steroids, except since it's using new technology like uh, WebSockets, uh, it works much, much faster. And I'm always amazed how fast it really works. But we'll see uh, when we go into the sample that Auto has prepared for us, you'll see how different that is. Now there's a question online, can we do a .NET run on this uh, low level? Yes, I'm just using Visual Studio here to actually create this, but you could use something else. In fact, I already have uh, a shell window open here and we could go and make a new directory, probably Blazor app 11. And I could do .NET, .NET new Blazor wasm put it in the current directory. Okay, so what this does now is, this is outside of Visual Studio, just using the .NET CLI, and we could take a look at what this created for us. It uses the same template that Visual Studio just used, except I'm now not in Visual Studio anymore. Uh, I could have done this on a Mac, I could have done this on Linux, I could actually open up Visual Studio Code if I was so inclined to look at this application. Uh, could develop it entirely with that, right? Here's our same pages. Um, and there we go, wrong folder. Uh, I could F5 out of this right here to launch this, or I could go ahead and I could just say .NET run. And this now builds this app, hosts it for us, does all the NuGet restores, everything that's needed to com compile this .NET application. And in a moment, we should actually see this up and running. And here is uh, the URL that it's gonna host this on. And we'll just go to a browser. Bring it over from the other screen. And here's that same exact app running and loading uh, now just out of the CLI and it works exactly the same, okay? Now there's a question online, can you do a .NET Watch on this? What is .NET Watch? .NET Watch is this ability uh, to actually run something and have a watcher see if you changed any parts of the application. Uh, and that works now, that's new in uh, .NET 5, Blazor 5, uh, which is really nice because now instead of doing .NET Run like I just did here, 
you can just do a .NET watch run, and then you can actually change your Blazor components <clears throat> behind the scenes and actually have an update. Okay. So that's a, a quick first lap around Blazor, um, and we'll, we'll go into more demos later. Now let's talk briefly, or not briefly, let's talk about .NET 5 and Blazor. Now, when we talk about Blazor 5 and .NET 5, we need to talk about what .NET 5 is. Uh, if you haven't seen our state of .NET and .NET 5, I encourage you to go back and watch that. We actually have two uh, events dedicated to that. Uh, but just briefly, what's new in .NET 5? Well, the big thing about .NET 5 is this one .NET vision that Microsoft has. When we look at how .NET has gone from two decades ago, ago when it first ran on Windows to all the things we've done since then, .NET got split into several different paths. We have the full framework, full Windows CLI, the legacy framework, as some people say, although that's still going to be supported for a long time to come. And then we made .NET Core. Then there's the Mono guys doing the Samarin stuff and running on mobile devices. Then there was the WebAssembly stuff. There's the Linux, the, the Mac version, and so on. And with that, we had a splintering of the .NET ecosystem, and we needed to determine somehow what runs where. So we made .NET standard, and that works pretty well. But it all solves this problem of there being multiple .NETs. .NET 5 is the unification step, going back to doing it all in one framework again. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, that's a journey. We are moving towards that. The goal has been achieved largely with .NET 5, but there's still some outliers that we don't have yet, like the, the Xamarin guys are still working on a lot of stuff. And this journey is to be completed with .NET 6, which will release uh, next November. But as far as we are concerned, on the website, Windows development, all that sort of stuff, cloud development, We've really completed that leg of the journey and we've come around to having this one platform now that is just .NET. It's you're targeting .NET 5, you're not worrying about targeting Windows or .NET standard anymore. You're not worried about, am I running on some other platform? You're just targeting .NET 5. It's a reunification of all these different uh, frameworks and runtime environments. Uh, if you want to know more detail about this, again, I encourage you to go back, watch our prior recording. Uh, this is kind of the overview of all the things we have running on this one .NET platform, from the desktop to web and cloud, to go to mobile, even the gaming and IoT and, and, and AI guys all run on this one platform again. We have one big happy, happy family, if you want to think of it like that. We have our tools that all work on that, whether it's Windows, Mac, uh, VS Code, uh, or if you're just a command line or a third party tool guy. And when you look at the timeline of this, uh, this journey started with .NET Core 3, but the unification really happened with .NET 5, which released just this past November. So that's where we are currently at. And now we are looking at annual releases in November. So .NET 6 will release in November 21. We already have this planned out to .NET 8 in November 23. Every other version is going to be what's called a long-term support version, LTS. Those are the committed versions that Microsoft will support for a long time, while .NET 5, for instance, is a general availability version. What that means is it's supported, will be supported for a while. It's going to very seamlessly transition into .NET 6. You're not going to have incompatibilities. And .NET 6 then does the whole, whatever it is now, 13-year support cycle or whatever Microsoft does. Okay. So question online is, should a new class library then be .NET 5? If you cannot make it .NET 5 rather than .NET standard, there's no particular downside to it other than backwards compatibility. If you need to use it, say, in a .NET 4.8 full framework Windows app that's never been moved to core, then maybe you want to stick to standard 2.0. But in general, there's not a lot of downside uh, to go into .NET 5. Side note, we did a whole special issue of our magazine focusing on .NET 5. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you probably got this in the mail, if you're a print subscriber. Uh, for everyone else, this is available online. If you're a subscriber, you can get it through the app. If you're not a subscriber, you can go 
to the website comac.com slash focus and it's all there i'm not selling you anything this is free uh, so go there check it out there's a blazer article in there there's also other stuff in there so, so take a look at that um, and this doesn't cost you anything so specifically looking at blazer within dotnet 5 what's new well first of all it's included you don't have to go download a special runtime anymore um, so it's now a standard compilation target. You don't compile anything special. Uh, you're just targeting .NET 5. It also has a lot of new features. Um, the new features are pretty much what you'd expect, just incremental features, but very interesting features. Uh, lots of performance improvements. So the interesting features are things like CSS isolation. That's a really cool feature, by the way. Let's say you're building a component, like that counter component that's in that default uh, sample or that survey component and let's say you want to css style that the trouble with that always is if you then compose an, a ui out of multiple components now you may be creating css styles that are conflicting and throw everything off so you have your app perfectly working and somebody creates a new component and within that component makes a, a css style that just happens to already be used elsewhere and it throws off your entire application css isolation keeps css specific to a certain component. It's a very, very useful feature. Uh, another feature, lazy loading, not loading the whole app at once, like the example that I just did does, but just loading what's needed. That is a huge step forward uh, in helping those initial startup uh, perception problems. Uh, so that solved a lot of that. There's also placeholder rendering, so the app doesn't start up with loading, but it starts up with the UI immediately visible. That's also very useful. We already talked about the .NET Watch capability that's been added, so that's great. Uh, it also aims to reduce the interop with JavaScript need, uh, which, you know, in the past, if you had to do things like access the header and change the header of your page, you had to dip into JavaScript, and Microsoft's aiming to eliminate that. And then there's debug improvements. If you've seen my first Blazor presentation, I, I did some debug examples, and debug was hard to set up. So usually what you did is, you set it up and then you did that type of debugging, whether you wanted to debug C sharp code in the browser in the dev tools, or whether you wanted to use VS code or, or one of those IDEs that allowed you debugging. And in my sample, I switched between those and it actually, the last sample failed because it was difficult to reconfigure that. And so Microsoft's worked a lot on making that better. Performance improvements are huge. In general, WebAssembly now runs, or, or C-sharp on WebAssembly now runs about 30% faster than in the .NET Core 3.1 timeframe. The UI rendering specifically, so the 30% the, the faster, is just running C-sharp code. But the UI specifically, let's say you're doing a UI that has a lot of uh, HTML components, say a large table, a grid with data, <clears throat> that is intensive in terms of the interop between HTML and C-sharp, and that runs between 200 and 400% faster. Uh, the now is virtualization support. So if you have a, a table with 100,000 rows, it now actually virtualizes that if you want, and it looks like you have 100,000 rows. The scroll bar is still there, but it really only shows the rows that are visible on screen and just makes it drastically faster. And then the pre-rendering, the placeholder rendering that alleviates that uh, startup perception, okay? Uh, here's an example of what's in the project now. If you look at the project file in .NET 3.1, uh, you had all this special stuff that got brought in. Now it's just the project uses the Blazor SDK and it targets .NET 5. That's all that's needed. So uh, let's dip into another example here and let's actually hand this over to my friend Otto. And Otto is going to show us how WebAssembly versus server compares, especially in performance. So Otto, take it away. All right, thank you, Marcus. Uh, yeah, client-side versus server-side Blazor, a question that really has been around uh, more or less since other year, ever since uh, client-side Blazor development has been an option since the release last year. And uh, to be frank, sometimes uh, it's not that easy to make that decision which which route to go, which way to go. Do I implement my project client side? Do I implement the service side? And 
A mistake I see a lot is people are excited about doing client side uh, web assembly development, you know, having that new full stack C sharp experience. Uh, when they really should be doing a, a server side uh, implementation of their project for some uh, quite obvious reasons. And um, to make that decision easier, you really have to think about what is your project doing, what are your expectations for it, and uh, how can you realize this? How can you um, take advantage of the server side or client side differences uh, and really get the most out of your implementation or your project? There is a few significant differences i would say when it comes to making that uh, choice between client-side and server-side implementation uh, that should guide you or lead you to your you know ultimate decision whether to do it one way or another um, it starts with all right what does your project do what do you expect it to do and how is it supposed to be available to your users or to your if you, for instance, say my project uh, is a web application, but it should also be available offline, right? Or if you want to install it as an app on your phone as a progressive web app, for instance, you really only have one choice, right? Server-side Blazor development is not an option in this case, but if you do it client-side, you can deploy your project as a progressive web app. It can be installed on your laptop, your computer, your phone, your tablet, and so on, and it can be implemented to work uh, online or offline. So that's one big advantage. The other uh, thing to consider is um, when you deploy it, if you deploy it sir, as a server side application, it is uh, required that you constantly have an internet connection as a client. So you constantly have to be connected to the server. On the other hand, the traffic that goes back and forth is limited, right? Because the only thing your client really receives is HTML, and a little bit of JavaScript, but all the calculations, all the um, layout and stuff, all that works and then is calculated on the, on the server. The client only really receives, um, hey, what do I display? And that's it, right? No calculations are made on the client. Um, theoretically, and I'm saying this theoretically because we're not quite there yet, but theoretically, client-side development, uh, when done in a, in a performant and optimal way should or could even outperform uh, JavaScript alternatives or equivalents of uh, some implementation. And that is because of the highly optimized uh, WebAssembly code that is created from Blazor uh, client-side development. Now I'm saying this in theory because we're not quite there yet. Yeah, we're going closer and we're inching closer and closer to that goal with every new release of uh, uh, .NET. So from, you know, 3.1, 3.2, and now 5, and then .NET 6 probably. It's getting more and more performant, obviously. So at some point, I'm positive we're going to be there. Uh, just not quite yet. Um, on the other hand, if you have an application that does a lot of heavy lifting, deals with a lot of data, does a lot of uh, computation that is requires a lot of resources, a lot of processing powers, uh, then if you look at a server side solution, you probably have a better performing application than a client side uh, equivalent. And we'll see this. I'm, I'm having a few examples prepared here that we'll show uh, where we have a project that does the same thing in a client side and a server side uh, solution. And we'll see in what instances is the server side project performing better and in what instances is the client side solution performing better. And uh, we'll draw our conclusions from that, and then we'll see uh, which way one would go uh, and they want to implement a certain uh, solution for a, a project or a, a problem. Um, let's go and see. I have here, I'm going to have to share my screen, obviously. My, all right, oh, I can just share this. Uh, I have here a solution that is the standard uh, Blazor starter app, right, with the three um, tabs that everybody knows. And I added one tab here that's called Superhero. And what this does, it's very simple. I have a, a combo box there with a few superheroes in there. And you can select a superhero. Uh, after you select one of these superheroes, Batman, Superman, or whoever, what the app does is it calculates the superpower of that uh, superhero you selected. And that superpower just so happens to be the 100,000th prime number 
uh, that one can find. The reason I chose this is because it takes quite a bit to calculate that, right? So it's uh, simulating an effort that takes a while to compute, uh, takes some resources to calculate. And in order to do that, we're gonna draw some resources from the server and we're gonna draw some resources from the client when we check out how the client solution performs in that scenario. Now here we see that this is the uh, server version of that project. I have the same one also as a client side deployment. I'm um, doing the same thing here. I'm calculating the 100,000th prime number again, and I'm going to add, um, give it to whatever superhero I selected as their superpower. So uh, whatever number that is should be the same number, regardless of what hero you select or uh, which solution we run, should be the same number. It's the only purpose is to show uh, that it takes some time to calculate it, and we're going to um, draw a distinction which one is faster. Now, I expect to see, well, the service side solution should be faster because we are having more resources available to us. The server is going to calculate that for us, assign it um, to that parameter, and give us back our um, solution or our result uh, over our constant signal, our uh, connection to the client, and we should see that result uh, after it has been calculated. Um, another big difference I'm expecting to see is that on the server-side deployment, our client should remain fully functional and should remain um, fully responsive while this calculation works, right? While this uh, superpower is calculated on the server, the client, I should be able to click and move around and highlight buttons on the website uh, because the server will notify the client over SignalR when this is done, when this is ready and, you know, transmit the result. On the other hand, on the client side, uh, if I'm using the exact same code base, right, the exact same project with zero changes to code whatsoever, it runs. I'm not purposely running anything asynchronously uh, if I'm using the exact same code base. And therefore, on the client, I should see that my client website is going to draw the resources and not be responsive while this calculation happens, right? It should, uh, we should see that I'm not going to be able to press any buttons or mouse over any or highlight uh, any other controls. So I have deployed this and uh, we have here uh, .NET Blazor wasm.azurewebsites.net deployment for the web assembly for the client side version of this little app. And here on .NET Blazor server.azurewebsites.net, the server side equivalent of this app. Again, exactly the same code. I made no changes to uh, the source code whatsoever. It's the exact same number and lines of code uh, in one and the other. Now, here on the server, if we go to the superhero tab, uh, as I said, we have here a little combo box with some superheroes in there. And let's select Batman. And as I select Batman, we'll see, it will take a few seconds for this to calculate. But while I'm selecting and while I'm uh, waiting for the result, I can move my mouse over these buttons here on the left and they will highlight and my app will remain responsive, right? So I can select Batman here. Uh, this remains responsive and here, what was it, two seconds later, maybe I have my number here that is Batman's uh, superpower. Now if I do the exact same thing client side, right? Let's go over here, let's go to superhero. And I'm also going to select Batman here, but you will see now I have no response, no um, feedback from my mouse anymore because my client is now calculating that superpower. And we're clearly over two seconds already, so that was more like seven, eight seconds now. We have that same number here that we have server side calculated. So the number is the same, the superpower is the same. It's just server side clearly outperforms the client side equivalent of that uh, because the heavy lifting is done on the server. Now, another example where I expect the opposite to see is anything that really has to do with user interaction that is very uh, intensive um, to, to do to display. Um, for instance, when I click on this button that says create squares here, what's going to happen is I'm creating 500 tiny little uh, blue squares and these squares are supposed to follow my mouse cursor on this screen no matter where I go. And this happens 
either a client side or a service side. Now client side, this is calculated. The client calculates the position with every mouse move, even if I move it just one inch or one pixel, um, it is calculated, the position is transmitted and it updates and renders uh, where these 500 little squares are. If I'm doing this on the server, however, every single time there is a movement of just one pixel, this has to be communicated between the client and the server. And that means I have a constant communication between client and server over the signal R uh, connection to update the client and tell the client, hey, you moved. Here is the new uh, coordinates for your 500 squares. And one pixel further to the left, up or down or wherever, the exact same thing happens again, right? I have to contact the server and say, hey, I moved my mouse. Here is the new coordinate of my mouse. The server calculates the coordinates for the 500 squares and transmits it back. So it is an enormous amount of traffic that has to go back and forth if you do something that is very UI intensive and UI responsive. So for instance, let's see, I'm creating my squares here and we're doing this service side right now, right? So I'm clicking on this button and here are my squares. It took like a second to appear and uh, you can see it's lagging behind, right? So if I move this down here and back up here, you can see the squares, yeah, they're following, right? But they're lagging behind quite a bit. It's like a two second delay almost uh, when I move my mouse cursor around here. Uh, you can see it knows all the steps, right? It follows the steps, but it is clearly lagging way behind and it's not very responsive. And that has to do with that constant back and forth connection, um, updating the cursor position, telling the server where I am, server calculating the new position for my squares and back and forth and going uh, two ways basically with every pixel that I move uh, to update these squares. Now, if I do this on a client, right, so let's do the same thing. I'm clicking here. The squares were there immediately, right? I did not have to wait for it. And as I move, um, the squares pretty much instantly follow my mouse, uh, mouse cursor anywhere where I go, right? So uh, there's a tiny little lag behind it, right? So there's like 0.3 seconds maybe or so where it's behind it. Um, but nothing nearly or even close to how uh, laggy it is when I move it um, server side, right? If I move this around server side, you can clearly see that uh, it takes a long time for all these updates to go through the signal R connection and uh, tell my client uh, again where to move these uh, little blue squares to. So, and that really is a good example of um, what you should think about when you decide to do your uh, project either client side or service side, right? Um, if you have something that does a heavy, uh, a job of heavy lifting, a lot of calculations, a lot of um, uh, processing, you probably are better off doing a server side implementation and have it all, you know, have all the resources of your server available to you. If, however, it is something where you need immediate feedback from the client, right? And whatever you do, if it's something like this where your, your mouse is involved or uh, something with keyboard interaction, maybe a game, right? Gaming is probably something that also will draw uh, a lot of advantages from uh, client-side web assembly implementation um, because you don't have to ask the server for updates, right? You can calculate all this directly on the client and uh, reflect the changes immediately. You don't have to wait for the server uh, to calculate results and return with the responses uh, that you want to display. Um, so whatever project you have, whichever category it falls in, really depends on where your bottleneck will be, what type of performance uh, you're looking for and where you're looking for uh, improvement in. Um, that should really determine uh, the route you should go, whether you should do client-side or uh, server-side implementations uh, of laser projects. All right, thank you. Thank you, Otto. So very interesting, I think. Uh, now, in some ways, I think probably what you would have expected, server round trips take some time, but when you really think about what we've just seen, server round trip takes less time these days than we would have expected in the past. So yes, as expected, but it, it drives home the point that the server side stuff also works pretty well, but, but there certainly is reason to do client side stuff. Now, another thing, another scenario that's very important for client-side stuff is that of PWAs or progressive web applications. 
Uh, progressive web applications are apps that you build like all other web apps, but you then install locally, whether that is on your Windows or Mac, or whether that is on say the start screen of your Android or iOS device. And I'm actually gonna play the ball back right away to Otto, um, as he's our resident PWA guy. Uh, as you saw in the intro that Jim did, Otto does a lot of weightlifting and uh, bodybuilding, and he will show us his uh, weightlifting app. So take it away one more time, Professor Muscle. Hello again. Yeah, uh, PWAs. Yeah, there is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, an option to deploy uh, client-side laser apps as uh, progressive web apps, and then you can run them and uh, use them offline. Uh, and make him look and behave just like a, a native app on your mobile device, for instance. And yeah, I do have an example for that as well. I'm going to show you, I'm going to share. Uh, if you go to lifterapp.azurewebsites.net, that's where I have deployed my own little app that I made for myself that helps me with my uh, weightlifting. You can uh, enter your equipment that you have, how many pounds or kilos of individual uh, plates you have, the, what the uh, bar weighs, etc. And uh, you can then go to the bar loader and say, I want to lift 600 pounds today, and it will tell you what uh, the loading uh, needs to look like on your bar. Now, I have deployed this as a progressive web app, as a Blazor client side application, uh, because I want to install it on my phone, right? I run this on my phone every time I go to the gym, and it helps me load the bar quickly without having to calculate uh, the plates that need to go on each side, right? And I can put in exactly what I have available in my inventory, and then it will calculate that on its own. So I have this, I don't have to go to a browser to open this all the time, right? I have installed it as a PWA, so it has its own icon, appears on the home screen, and looks and behaves just like a native app um, on Android and iPhone, but it didn't have to go through the approval process from the App Store, right? Because essentially it's a website. It's just wrapped as a PWA. And you can install this on the computer too, right? If you open any website that has PWA capabilities on the top navigation bar here, you should have an install button here. Uh, I've already installed it, so I can just open it, right? So it says, hey, open this as the Lifter app, and then it is here, right? So now that's my app. It's not inside the browser window anymore. It's now its own window uh, and behaves like a regular Windows app, right? And still, uh, now I can use it offline too, right? If I have it installed on my computer, I could use it on my laptop as well. And not only can I use it offline, I can also take advantage of stuff uh, that my device, my computer, or my phone also provides uh, to save certain things even offline, right? So on uh, mobile devices and on computers, you, for instance, have access to IndexedDB, which uh, you can use as a small little local database to save uh, certain records. I use it, for instance, to save my workout. Right? If I want to save uh, the lifts that I do, I can go here to log and say, hey, I have left today I have uh, 650 pounds deadlift. I did it for one rep, right? I want to save it. Uh, then it goes into that log. I can clear my entire log again if I want to, or I can go into the stats and I can see what have I already saved. Now, obviously, since this is client site, I don't have the entries that I did on my phone on other devices, right? So this is per device. Every device has its own indexed DB and its own record. So probably not gonna be very helpful for me to have it here on my computer because I have all my data on my phone already. Uh, but just to showcase, uh, this is now the data that is loaded from the database um, that is located on my computer, on my laptop here. And these are the lifts that I have uh, entered here. This is the deadlift I just entered. Um, and if I were to you know, open the dev tools, I can see under storage, under index DB, these are the entries from this index DB. So you can see this is where that is stored. Now, the one downside is obviously it is only local, right? So if I had multiple devices, I couldn't keep track of all my um, workout logs or whatever this way. It only goes by device. 
Uh, what I'm doing though, I'm working on uh, a sync where I actually want to save it in Azure as well. And I'm just using IndexedDB as a local cache, so to say, to keep them uh, during my workout and then sync it up with the server. Otherwise, I'm not quite done yet with that, but that's the next step that I'm working on. Um, but just to show, you can do that uh, with Blazor WebAssembly, right? So if you were to go to this website, uh, no, not that one, this one, um, if I put it back into the browser, liftwrap.azurewebsites.net, uh, then you can see what I use for my workouts. Feel free to use it if you want. Uh, and if you open it on a mobile device, your browser should ask you, hey, would you like to install this app on your mobile device? If you click yes, then you get a nice little icon on your home screen where uh, you can then start the app from and it will not open in the browser window. It will open in its own little shell and it will look just like a regular native app, right? So yeah, that's just an example of a PWA that I use that makes use of Index TV. And I uh, just wanted to uh, share that as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, so interesting stuff. Uh, PWAs, of course, aren't specific to Blazor as such, but just because of how Blazor works and the abilities you have around .NET and how you write your code, I think to me, it's a really compelling scenario to create PWA apps using Blazor. Now let's actually move along here and let's take this a step further. I want to introduce something new to you uh, that we have been working on together with many others and we are calling this thing Fokino. This is very, very new. Uh, the image you see here is uh, Fotino birds. Fotino is this theoretical particle. Uh, the Fotino birds are from some science fiction novel. They're not actually the real logo. Logo is coming. Uh, but what is this thing? Well, Fotino is an open source project that was originally started by Steve Sanderson from Microsoft, who used WebWindow or, or created this thing called WebWindow that uses WebView 2. What is WebView 2? WebView 2 is basically Chromium Edge, Microsoft's latest browser, encapsulated in a control, which independent of all this is really useful. We're using this a lot, works great. If you wanna embed a browser in a, in a Windows app, uh, I much prefer this now over Chromium. It's more lightweight, easier to install. And so this was used by Steve Sanderson to create this thing called Web Window, which is essentially uh, similar to Electron, if you've ever used that, and you read his blog post there. And so what we've done is we've uh, stepped in, taken on a lot of the open source load for this stuff. Uh, but this is not just us. This is a project, it's a community project. You can partake in this if you want. And this is meant to be essentially a better version of Electron. Okay? So if you're familiar with, uh, familiar with Electron applications, <laughs> or if you're not familiar, I should say, Electron is this environment that was originally created by GitHub based on Google's Chromium engine that can be used to develop desktop applications using mobile technologies. And a lot of different projects are actually based on that, whether that's Visual Studio Code, whether that's Slack, Azure Data Studio, Evernote, and so on and so on. So quite a few high profile applications are based on top of Electron. Now Electron has a lot of good things. If you're a web guy, it's a much uh, more natural way for you to develop desktop applications. Um, uses your standard web technologies, HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS, and so on. But it also has some downsides. In particular, it's very heavy and resource intensive, and, and, and that's not ideal, obviously. Uh, so Fotino is essentially that, but based on Chromium Edge. So it's a, modern, a, a more lightweight, modern, streamlined browser. Uh, and other than that, it's very similar. So what can you build with Fotino.net? or Fotino in general. Well, you can build anything you can build with Electron. Uh, you can reuse your JavaScript libraries and create uh, projects out of that, whether it's Angular View, any, any JavaScript library really. Um, and also then build a .NET 5 backend or Node.js, whatever, right? It's a regular web app, just like uh, Electron is. It's just based on the Chromium Edge branch of the Chromium product line and, and it's more modern and more lightweight. Now, what's really cool is you can then add Blazor into that. When you really think of what Blazor WebAssembly does, it would make a lot of sense to use it inside of an Electron-like setup to build desktop applications. And that's what uh, this open source project that we are supporting is aiming for, right? So you can build your 
desktop applications basically on top of Laser WebAssembly, and then it runs cross-platform. So you can run it on Mac, Linux, you can run it on iOS, Android, anything that runs um, the, the Chromium engine, okay? So, yeah, so, so why is this appealing? Well, it's appealing for a number of reasons. Uh, for one, it does require Node.js for backend work. You're more free to choose whatever you want. It's much smaller and more lightweight and thus addressing one of the primary issues uh, with the Electron setup. And especially if you already have uh, .NET 5 installed on your system, it's a huge difference. Uh, you see some stats here, uh, generally less than half of what Electron took even without .NET installed and with .NET installed. Um, it, uh, it, it goes down to almost nothing. Uh, and there's a question line, how does Potino compare to web window? It, it's the same thing. It's the continuation, right? When, when Steve started this as a, almost like a sample, he called it web window. Now that it's maturing, we need a real name and we're calling it Potino. Um, so that's the basic idea here. There's a few other, uh, stats that I have in here, memory or something. I'm not going to go into all these details. We'll probably do a Potino, uh, webinar, whether it's data.net or, or some code presents webinar, but, uh, but it's just much more lightweight is the main thing. Now, but in direct comparison, of course, Electron is much more mature. Potino is the new thing. Um, but other than that, you know, we're, it's a community project. We're just supporting it. Uh, you're more than welcome to join it. Now, one of the things that's really, really interesting is you can start extending that in interesting ways. Uh, so for instance, when you do Electron development, it has its feature set that it comes with. And yeah, you could partake in that open source project too. <clears throat> but because Fotino is .NET based, there's a lot of C++ in there too, but it's generally .NET based, we can extend it in very interesting ways. For instance, let's say you're building a Blazor or a view or an Angle application and that app opens up a new view. It usually opens in place, right? You may have the menu down the side, you click on something, and a new HTML opens up. Well, we can intercept that in Fotino and start opening a new window, but only in environments where that works. So on the phone, you keep it in place, but in a Windows application, maybe optionally, you want to open multiple windows like you would in a more typical Windows app. And it provides that kind of control over it. Now, a lot of people say, how is this different from PWAs? Uh, well, progressive web apps are essentially browser apps running inside of this environment. Um, the Fotino app gives you a lot more options. You can branch out from that and do a whole lot of different things uh, on top of that. So let's actually play the ball back to Otto one more time. And uh, he's going to show us a little bit about Fotino as a representative example of some of the things you can do that provide you a lot of control over things you could. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, now that you know what Fortino is and why we're doing it, uh, let's take a little look at an example that we have where we run a web application, specifically a Blazor application inside of our Fortino app. And as you'll see, it will have the same functionality that uh, regular Blazor apps have when they come as a starter app. Plus, additionally, we have uh, an extra page in there that showcases some of the functionality a regular Blazor app could not do. Our application can because it has access to those system calls uh, through Fotino. So let's share the screen and let's take a look. Uh, here you can see the Blazor app, the starter app, running in our Fotino uh, window. You know the home counter and fetch data tabs from the uh, Blazor starter app, which uh, still work as expected, right? So there's no difference here, but here on the left side, we have the window tab uh, with additional uh, settings that we can set. And these go right through the Fotino pipeline and do make these system calls and have an influence on the application from inside our Blazor application. So I, for instance, can say I would like to change the width of my window, right? And uh, it goes and changes in size immediately. Uh, I can say, as you, could, as you just saw, the window is resizable, right? I can change it as a regular window, but I can say, I would like to, you know, not allow this and not make my window resizable anymore. And I can still scroll, but I cannot change the width either. 
I can also say I would always want my blazer up here to be the topmost window uh, and not anything uh, overlay it, right? So I can say, because if I were to, for instance, bring up this notepad file here, um, it would hide my blazer app. But if I set this to be the topmost window all the time, I cannot go and uh, change what is going to be in the foreground anymore. My Blazor app will now be always in the foreground, uh, which is handled through the Fotino uh, system calls and make sure that my app now always is visible. Something I wouldn't be able to do if I were to create my Blazor app as a standard web application because it runs inside of a browser and I do not have access to these kind of things uh, through Blazor itself. So yeah, this is something that uh, we're very excited about. We're very eager to get to the first release version for it. And I'm sure as soon as it's there, uh, there will be an announcement and uh, you'll be able to you know, uh, try it out, work with us even, it'll be uh, open source and also community involved. Uh, we'll be very happy to have people who are interested in this help us, work with us, uh, give us some suggestions, even do some uh, pull requests that we can look at and incorporate. So yeah, we're, we're looking forward to working with a community and drive this project even further. All right, thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, so as you see, these are some examples, right? Whether you wanna make your window top level or always top or not, the point is that you now have this type of control, this type of control and many other things. You, you have much more control over the Chrome or the window, you could add standard Windows UI elements and combine it with your app. And that's lots of ideas we have. Now, like I said, this is not our project. We're just supporting uh, this, this open source project. Uh, there's no public URL for it yet. We're still working with Steve from Microsoft to take that over and put it onto a more solid basis in terms of having a real URL. And Auto, by the way, has been very instrumental together with Mike Yeager, who you may have seen appear in, in prior online events we did. Um, those two guys have been driving that a lot with the help of others. Um, so thank you very much. And I think this is an exciting development with lots of stuff to come. Uh, again, I'm not trying to sell you something. This is an open source project. And we will have more announcements and I'm sure information in Code Magazine and other events that focus on that. But it just makes sense to combine it with Blazor, although you don't have to. Uh, and that's why I wanted to get it into today's presentation. Now, before we get to the Q&A portion of this, um, let's get through a, a few other announcements. Again, there's an event survey up. You can really help us by filling out this survey. We always appreciate feedback and suggestions for other topics. And uh, so it's just very short, just one page with a few quick questions to fill out. Would really do us a favor if you could help us with that. Um, another thing that Jim already mentioned, but I wanted to mention it one more time. We have a lot of people that sit in these presentations and then they say, oh, this is interesting. I wonder how that applies to my particular project. If you have that situation, feel free to contact us. Uh, we are offering this uh, one hour of free consulting, no strings attached type of uh, follow up to the event. It's been popular, so make sure you request it right away. It's lots of limited and first come, first serve. Uh, so if you take a lot of long time to do this, you may be further back in the schedule. Um, but that's been, a, I think, a good thing uh, in following up and helping people make sense of these uh, presentations we are doing and how they apply to them. Uh, another thing, uh, Code Magazine, uh, which you now all get a subscription unless you specifically tell us that you don't want one. Uh, we have a relatively new mobile app that came out at the beginning of this uh, whole virus crisis uh, last year in March or April, I think. Uh, check it out. It has all the code content on it. We are making most of our, all our content for free uh, during this crisis while people are still stuck at home. All the focus stuff, uh, the special dot that five issue is on there. Again, that's also on the website, but if you like to read in mobile apps, uh, this works nice. And, and if you, you know, want to tell your friends about it and so on, that does us a favor too. Uh, and Code Magazine, by the way, uh, is free as a benefit if you're a Microsoft customer. If you have a VSS subscription, formerly uh, known as MSDN subscriptions, or even if you have the free Dev Essential stuff, you can go into your benefits and activate a code subscription. You get a print magazine. Uh, courtesy of Microsoft. So uh, again, take advantage of that. Tell your friends about it. Now, the next Theta.net event is already on the calendar. 
as always, last Wednesday of the month. Uh, this next one is going to be a, a topic that's very dear to my heart. May not be as sexy as Blazor, but it sure is very important when it comes to protecting your investment. And, and a lot of these heavy duty apps still need that. And we're talking about the state of Windows desktop development. So we'll talk about things like WPF and WinForms running on top of .NET 5, for instance. We're talking about WinUI. We're talking about Fluid UI. We're talking about the stuff the Xamarin guys are doing with things like Maui. We, we may even talk a little bit about Electron and Totino again. Uh, so lots of interesting stuff there. Uh, that should help you protect your investment and even go forward with new development because uh, there's always a lot of new development as Windows desktop applications, even though it's not the flashy thing that everybody talks about. Now, we also have other state of .NET scheduled already. Uh, the month after, we're doing a, a DevOps presentation. The month after, we're doing Azure. It might be the other way around. But anyway, check it out on the website. We already have uh, the next three months planned out. So that's kind of nice. And we're we're going to be one of the requests we got from the surveys, plan it out a little more as so we try to be diligent about that. And that concludes the main part of this presentation. Thank you very much for attending. Now I see I have a ton of questions online and I'll just work my way from the bottom up now uh, to answer all your questions. But that's uh, the end of the regular presentation. Thank you very much uh, for attending. So Questions that we have here, Sandbox for Potino apps. So is the Sandbox the same as for browsers? Well, the interesting thing with Potino is you could actually break out of that. Now, it's not going to be just working cross-platform because if you break out of the Sandbox and do something that's Windows-specific, then that's not going to work on iOS, for instance. But yes, you could fundamentally uh, break out of that. And, and yes, one of the big things about Potino is, and, and same is true for Electron and some of those, is that you can talk much more directly to local hardware. So if you have a specialty USB device, for instance, good luck talking to that from a PWA, but you can do it in, in those types of apps. So that's a very important scenario for Putino. Uh, there's several questions that I've seen around authentication. Uh, don't have enough time to really go into the details of authentication, but there's authentication libraries that are standard part of Blazor for server and client side. And so you can bring those in and do your authentication. Logically, it's a little different from whether you do it on the server or the client, right? Um, there's a question about Fotino and is it uh, basically go live or is it still uh, in beta? It's still in preview at this point. Um, so we don't have a URL quite yet, but if you ping us directly, we'll get you our internal URL and we're working with Microsoft on getting that set up for general availability and for, for the public to work on it and help out and partake in it more easily. There's uh, at least two questions, I think, around Blazor WebAssembly and threading. Anything in the browser is fundamentally single-threaded. So the execution engine for code in the browser, whether that's JavaScript, or whether that's uh, WebAssembly, is single-threaded in nature. And so there's developments around that because the Blazor team would certainly like to address that. I'm not totally sure what I can say at this point, um, but that's certainly an issue that's on everybody's drawing board. Now, making calls to data can be multi-threaded because the browser's data access model or HTTP pipeline uh, runs on background threads. But it's very interesting that in general, in the browser, you do everything single thread. And now people say, oh, but JavaScript does all this asynchronous stuff. Yes and no. JavaScript itself doesn't do any of that. It's all the browser's execution engine for web requests. There's no way in JavaScript to say, run this multi-threaded. Right? So that's actually quite, quite interesting. Um, and Blazor falls under that same thing, but it's everybody understands it and wants to fix that. So there should be stuff coming. Uh, do we think that Blazor will be the main choice for web development? Uh, could it be the first choice rather than Angular or Vue? I don't know at this point, to tell you the truth. We see it's very popular. We see it's very popular in the Microsoft world, but there's a huge web developer world out there that's grown up on JavaScript. So we'll have to see how that develops, but it's, it's nice to see that a lot of things are happening <clears throat> and it's getting popular. Um... There's a question about the demo that Otto showed with the prime number calculations. And the question is, 
if the client is essentially the same capability hardware as the server, would it be just as fast? And, and it totally depends, right? I'll give you the consultant's answer. So WebAssembly is very close to true binary code, but not totally. So all things being equal, .NET should run a little faster on bare metal than in WebAssembly, but they're trying to get closer and closer and it, it's pretty good in WebAssembly, but it's gonna be a tad slower. Now on the server, you may of course be dealing with things like virtualization and virtual machines running stuff. So you, you have another layer there, which probably means the server is slowed down a little bit as well. But yeah, so maybe pretty close with the server being slightly faster for very CPU intensive things. Uh, you also have the advantage of multi-threading, of course. Uh, so it might be slightly faster. And when you do something like the prime number calculations, your overhead of going to the server is a one-time thing. You go to the server, it does all the heavy duty and comes back. Now, what's more problematic is when you do that trip a lot of times, like in the example with the trailing squares, because now you're taking that trip so often and that overhead of that trip is, you know, three orders of magnitude worse than any uh, penalty you, you take otherwise. Questions about graphic support. Uh, I think that is probably just for Blazor in general, that question. Uh, you're still dealing with HTML. So you can do HTML, you can even do Canvas API, you can do OpenGL, there's no restrictions in that whatsoever. And I thought there was another question around accessing the component model. It's just HTML guys, it's just browser tech. So you can access Introp into that browser uh, and manipulate the DOM and, and do anything the browser can do. There's no restrictions, there's nothing different. It's just the standard browser. Uh, the question, can we use WebAssembly and server-side together? The answer to that is yes, that's the short answer. The longer answer is out of the box, there's nothing set up for you. There's no templates that I've seen yet. There may be, I'd have to dig a little deeper, that make that possible. But it's just like any other single page app at that point. So you can have a bigger page that's server side, and then you can just make one URL, uh, this Blazor client side or even Blazor server side app if you want. Now the logistics of working out the details, that's a little tricky just like it is with Angular or Vue or any of those. Um, but yes, that's most certainly possible if you want to go that route. Uh, Signal R uh, question, uh, that tech is used uh, server-side and client-side. <clears throat> Let's see, hybrid apps, we answered that. Can you compile a Blazor component as a web component that we're talking about standard, not, not Blazor components? And that's another question that I saw coming by somewhere. Everything is called components these days and it gets really confusing. Uh, so for the most part, when we talk .NET 5, web development, the components are these Razor or Blazor components. Um, now those do not directly compile to a standard web component. You could probably make that happen somehow. I haven't played with that. I, I don't see why you couldn't, but it's not out of the box like that. Um, could you combine it with other UI frameworks like React or Vue? Uh, you probably could. There's nothing in there out of the box and it's probably gonna be a little tricky, but yeah, I don't see why you couldn't make that happen in general. In fact, it'd be a nice addition that the community pro could provide. I don't know if anyone has done that yet. I'd have to dig into that. Uh, authentication, I think we answered that. There's libraries for that. Um, can the HTML button's click event be accessed in C-sharp codes? I'm, I'm guessing if you wanted to wire it up after the fact, then uh, yes, you can do interop with that and, and just access the final HTML. Can you combine server and client side Blazor? That's kind of similar to the other question you had with the single page apps. Uh, yes, you can, but it's not there out of the box. You'll have to do that yourself. Uh, can you do server side Blazor in a load balanced web farm? Yes, absolutely you can. Uh, can you do, let's see, the WebAssembly DLL for client-side, SignalR for server-side. I don't know what the detail question is there. 
uh, there needs to be more in-depth discussion. He says, yes, that's probably true. So that would be probably more question for a detailed laser training class. But yeah, you can, I guess the simple answer is you can combine those things, but I'm not sure what the exact scenario is. Uh, logging for Blazor server side is a question that's just standard logging. We have our own logging framework. There's other logging frameworks out there you can probably log into, or you probably would want to log into Azure if you're running that way. Uh, can Blazor apps use the same MVVM view models as developed for desktop? Uh, quite possibly, but it depends on the details you've used. And one of the differences is you don't need to do the I notify property change stuff that you often have to do in WPF and those flavors, um, but I guess it doesn't hurt for it to be there. Uh, different ways for JavaScript libraries to interact with the DOM, Shadow DOM. No difference in Blazor. You can, you can do all that stuff in Blazor and call into that. If you want to run Blazor on the server in Azure, this, this is a very good question, actually. Uh, so the question is, can I run Blazor server in Azure as a platform as a service or a software as a service, or do you have to create a VM? When you deploy Blazor to an Azure server, it's like an ASP.NET app. So you can do an app service and deploy that app and it becomes a server-side Blazor app. If you are doing a client-side Blazor app, you can do that, or you can actually use static web apps. Uh, you, you need very low infrastructure, you have very low infrastructure requirements when uh, running a client-side WebAssembly Blazor app in Azure. So it just needs to be served up as a static website. You can use the cheap new static website stuff for that. And that's really all you need. Uh, so it's very, very well integrated with Azure, I guess is the short answer to that. And then there's a question about API secrets. Um, there's components for that uh, is the uh, short answer, but for details, we'd have to follow up and see what the exact details are. And I think uh, there was a question about F Sharp and VB. You could bring those in as, as existing DLL, but the framework itself is based on C Sharp. So you could combine them, but you can't do say an F Sharp event handler at this point, just in the Razor page, because Razor page is a C sharp. And I think that's it for the question. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, glad to see <clears throat> that we had great attendance today. And again, if you have any questions after the fact, feel free to contact us, uh, include Jim uh, on the email, because I'm always behind and slow in answering, so you get a much faster answer from Jim but we will answer all the emails. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you liked it. Uh, give us feedback, fill out the survey if you could, and hope to see you next time at the Windows Desktop Development State of .net. Thank you very much. <laughs>